Okay, interview with Paul Shortina from Rough Cut, CRS, and a few other things that he's doing. Quiet Riot. Quiet Riot. And a few other things that he's doing. We'll get into all that in just a minute. How are you doing, Paul? Great. Okay, I want to go kind of for people who don't know who you are and for people who kind of want some memories down memory lane and just the whole nine yards for everybody out there. I kind of want to start in the very, very beginning to start this off. And we'll go through, you know, Quiet Riot and Rough Cut and CRS and producing and just different things like that. But So let's start off in the beginning. How did you get into music? Um, about how old were you and what influenced you to start doing what you're doing? Well, I... A friend of mine's brothers were playing guitar and they uh, had a guitar and we stayed out all night, slept out, made a tent kind of thing. I was back in Ohio. Okay. I was 11 years old. I didn't put the guitar down. Where are, you, where are you originally from? Lyme, Ohio. Lyme, Ohio. Okay. And um, anyways, we were outside and, and he brought this guitar and I couldn't stop playing it. But before that, I had... When I was a little kid, a ukulele. Uh, my mom, all her family was into music. So like, music, like, what were they into? Uh, they were doing uh, guitars, mandolins. They do vaudeville stuff, banjos. My uh, my uncle, my great uncle, played banjo, uh, ukulele, mandolin, and uh, pretty more um, a lot like bluegrass stuff. Okay, you know. And kind of like Bill Monroe and stuff like that, so. Yeah, in that kind of genre yeah. stuff. A lot of old standard stuff that, you know, I mean, right. going way back. It's not the same type of bluegrass we hear now. It may be yeah. similar, some of it. And vaudeville, my mother sang. So I was around it, you know. And once I got a hold of the guitar thing, I was kind of like sucked really in. But I, I was singing. I started singing when I was about five years old. What made you want to do rock and roll? Seeing the Beatles and everybody Beatles. on Ed okay. Sullivan, you know, uh, and seeing Led Zeppelin, you know, take it to another level, okay. you know, just the whole British invasion, not to mention some of the great bands that we had here in the United States, like Aerosmith and Leonard Skinner. I mean, I just, I like all kinds of music. Rock, to me, right. rock. We have people have stamped names on it calling hard rock, metal, metal rock. It's just, they have just different categories now for whatever you want to call it. But exactly. Rock's rock, whether it's hard or just rock. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Tesla call. You know, you I mean, want you, yeah, you, I mean, to me, rock is ACDC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, quote Tesla, call it what you want, it's still yeah. music to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I like all kinds of music. I was really into Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin. Always, uh, Really in the uh, bands with really good singers. Yeah, we were talking about the Temptations earlier today, yeah. too. Yeah, I was very much into the R&B yeah. scene. I thought, I thought the black singers really had it going on then. No, absolutely. I don't think there are as good as singers now in R&B than well, were back then. It's a totally different style. But and they, I don't know if you... They've agree. lost some of that soulness to me. I mean... Oh, yeah, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but R. Kelly, okay, let's take R. Kelly, for example, listed as R&B. There is no rhythm and no blues, therefore it's not R&B. Yeah. There's another, uh, I would say it's uh, soul music or pop to some extent. Yeah, like R. pop Kelly. soul or something. Yeah. yeah. But it's not the same as Sam and Dave and the yeah. Temptations, Four Tops... Any of that. Well, right? Rita Franklin, James Brown. Yeah, I mean, those good. people, they had something that nobody was doing. Oh, you know? I know. They're just they, they, That the British locked on to and bada bing, bada boom. Exactly. Made it rock and roll, you know. They took they took all the same music that, that they were putting out here, you know, Ike, Tina Turner, all that stuff, and just... Oh. Willie Dixon, oh, yeah. Led Zeppelin, Robert all over Johnson. the place, and yeah, totally. So I mean, uh, really, it was born here, even though. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Just the British stars just kind of brought it back into the fold. They they refined it and and they and made it, it acceptable big, to society. Yeah. And a lot of they brought a lot of those guys back in the big blues revival. Yeah, they did. Yeah, it was it was really cool. Mm -hmm. It's really cool that they did do that because they yeah. actually brought out it to a, a, a mass. Especially when Zeppelin came out, it was like, wow, 
then you find out that most of the songs were written by Willie Dixon. But I didn't yeah. know it when I heard them when I was a kid. Yeah, the same oh, thing. Oh, wow, with- that's... That's the coolest stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. Same thing as, like, the Stones back in the Oh, movie. yeah. So, you know, they were doing the... Doing Howlin' Wolf and everything else. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I think it was Paul McCartney and John Lennon told... Uh, they were all good friends. And told Jagger and uh, Richard, you guys got to start writing your own stuff so you can make some money. Well, yeah, you know, it, publish it. Interesting side note. You know, you know who, uh, who uh, influenced the Beatles? Bill Haley's comments. Oh, I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of influence there. It's all. Oh, yeah. It's all from back, forward, back, and back, and, and, yeah. and even the the soul was yeah. coming out. Exactly. Because they did a remake of quite a few, like Mr. Postman. And oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, what was your first band? My first, first band was. Band? How did it come about? Neighbors. Okay. Garage band. In Ohio, I think we were 13. Started playing school, talent things, dances, you know, just doing it that way. I mean, and and from there, uh, my parents split up, and my mom's family had migrated to California, so she was going back to where her parents were. So from there, that brought you to LA. That brought us to actually Glendale, California, okay. which is close to Eagle Rock, Pasadena, and you know, Hollywood. It's all real connected. Yeah. And then from there, I, I lived in Los Angeles for about 40 years of my life. And Were there any bands that you played in out there that oh, might yeah. be memorable or whatever just before? Because the whole music scene, as I've been doing this, I've learned it. You name somebody and they know, well, I know Nikki Six and I know oh. Blackie Lawless and I know... I Nathan didn't get Brown. into the Hollywood thing till I, I put a band together, quite a few bands. Um, there was these concerts that were going on and we were called the... Uh, well, not to skip junior high, I, I, we had a band together. We right. started playing in clubs when I was like 16 to make a, help make a living for my mom and my right. brothers and sisters. And it just so happened, I could, um, sugar, I could, <laughs> sugar, come here, get down, yes, good dog. Anyways, I could play in clubs, Right. as long as my mom weren't there. She was waitressing, sometimes bartending in some of the clubs, and we played in this place called Under the Ice House, and it was me, uh, a, a buddy of mine, Dave Smith, and Tony DiGiovanni, the drummer. And this band was called The Reestablishment, and we were actually in a movie called The Stewardesses. Okay. That was a, it was a hardcore porn for that time, <laughs> but it really wasn't. It was right. A, it was a R, maybe, maybe RX. Maybe. Right. But we, we were the band. We didn't know what we were, what we were getting into. But right. this, this club that we played had an airplane, a World War I airplane, Snoopy plane hanging from the ceiling. Bunch of boats, like uh, whaler boats all around, and we became the house band there. And then from that point, I uh, hooked up with the same guitar player that was I was playing with, and uh, Scott Gorm, who later went to uh, Britain and got in Den Lizzy. Okay. And uh, but we all hung out together. Everybody was from Glen on that click so and this club was in Glendale so I and I was I was about 16 and um, and just went through a bunch of different genres of music and different bands and there was a place in Glendale called Shell Canyon and they had concerts there with the strawberry alarm clock this is like you know they were bringing bands back from the 60s and yeah. stuff you know so it was kind of it's kind of cool, and they were outdoor concerts, so being local bands, we get to get up there and play, you know. And I uh, bounced around and uh, had a record when I was 18, and the song was uh, number 22 on the charts on Billboard. Uh, it was, was with it? Uh, Coco Dolan's, which was Mickey Dolan's sister, but we got in a contract problem after the track was cut. What was the name of the song? Follow Me. Okay. It was a 45, and Snuff Garrett, who produced Sonny and Cher and a whole bunch of different people, was the producer. 
of the track. And it was me and a chick, and she just sang on the choruses, and it was 22 with a bullet, and uh, it just so happened that uh, Vicki Lawrence, Carol, Carol Burnett Burnett show, had a song that was... Uh, the night the lights went the out light, The lights went out in Georgia. That's the night that the lights went out in Georgia. Well, she was on the same label. It was on Bell Records. Okay. Well, because her, they jumped on her because she was on the Carol Burnett show. And I was nobody, you know. And so, boom, they just, like, kicked it to the curb. And it was 22 with a bullet. And so all the people that I had, I just got my... My feet wet with recording when I did that. And the flip side of that song was what you do without, what would you do without music? But um, that was when I was 18, uh, around that time, 18, 19 years old. And then I just went through a bunch of different bands, different projects. I, I, I got signed up with this management people that wanted to make me the new Elvis Presley of the 70s. Okay. And uh, they changed me, my name to Isaac Perry. And uh, those were some wild years. Oh, I bet. I was out front as a singer, and uh, they had a four piece band behind me. And uh, Red Buttons was involved with us. Really? How'd that come Well, how'd that, we okay, how'd that come about? <laughs> was through this management company called Neil Management. My manager's name was Woody. And um, found us, because we, this band, we'd play from nine to two, and then after that, we'd play after hours from three in the morning till seven. Okay. So we'd just play sometimes from three to six straight without taking a break, just jamming, you know. So this guy saw us one night there, signed us up, blah, 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 and they're affiliated with Red buttons and all this stuff and we did this big party in Beverly Hills in the mountains in there and there was 150 tables on the lawn with pink tablecloths. Us magazine, People magazine's there, everybody's there. They got valet parking. We don't know they got valet parking because we pitch every penny we got to get a limo so everybody sees us get out of the limo and goes, who are these folks? But let me tell you, the people that were there were like Ed McMahon, James Coburn, Barbara Streisand, Dennis Hoffman, Barishnikov. Uh, I, the, the names go on. It was one of these parties, you know. And so we had brought this huge sound system in and uh, <laughs> had a keyboard player on the roof and the sound man was on the roof. It was a square flat roof. Huge place. We came out and all the tables are full. There's, you know, there's a thousand people there. You know, it's close to that. It's a huge place. Big mansion. We did one song. <sighs> Not the right crowd, you know, for uh, heavy rock, you know right. what I mean? But it was, it, it, it had its own vibe to it. It was a trip. We had violins going on, you know, to where it was, you know, it was, had some, Eisel had some depth to him, you know. He was right. supposed to be the new Elvis Presley, you know. This is my management telling me this. And I took this tape home to my father, you know, as Eisel Perry, and he took, tossed it in the, uh, in the oven, fried it, said, so who you are, not some but they want to make you some, don't change your name or try to change where, who, where you're coming from. And I was like, wow, this is pretty heavy. My dad knew this. But at this party, everybody just runs in, you know. I mean, we just blew everybody out. And they weren't going to let us in the pad, you know, because Barishnikov was in there and Streisand. They didn't want anybody around him. So we were only allowed a certain area. But James Coburn told him, he said, if the uh, band doesn't get to come in, We all hung out in the, the kitchen, but it was really weird. The first song, I jump up in the air, and I get this cape, and I come down on my knees, and I land on two huge, 